it is to be in your presence, Lord. Your Holy Spirit leading us. Your Holy Spirit guiding us. As we stand in awe and wonder of your majesty. As we worship you. As we lift you up. We know you're right there with us. God, we know that you're here. We know that you're meeting us. We thank you for your love. God, we worship you.
here Lord you are here Lord and we thank you for being here with us for meeting us where we are Father God you are an amazing God we lift your name on high today Father we thank you for meeting us here and being with us walking through life with us giving us guidance giving us blessings giving us corrections God you are an amazing God we love you we 
lift our, our voices to you. We praise your name, the God that breaks chains, the God that saves souls, the God that even though I was lost and sinning, reached down and rescued me. You're such an amazing God. You are powerful, Lord. And we just lift our name, our, our voices and your name up, Lord. We lift this service up to you and we pray that you just continue to be here with us because we are not enough without you. We want you with us with everything we do, Father God. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Give a shout of praise. Holy, wow. It's so hard to follow that up. Give him a shout. Did you hear your voices? That was beautiful. That's what God wants from you. He wants you to give it to him. That was a, a powerful moment. But I don't want it to be a moment. I want it to be like that always, forever. And our God can do that if you let him, right? Well, welcome, everybody. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> My name is Manny, if you didn't hear Issa call me out, and uh, I help with the youth here, and I play on the worship team, but more importantly, i like to welcome you all here and be just a member here at Grace Point Church with you. Amen. And at this time, we're going to dismiss our Grace kids, so you guys can go to the back. Miss Janie's got her hand waving there. And the Arise Youth, you guys can pop in the back. I'll join y'all in just a moment. And please be seated as the kiddos are transitioning. I know, your legs need a break. Y'all were stomping and shaking and moving. I tell you what, I'm not normally the jumping around kind of worshiping guy. I kind of sit here in my little circle and do this. But in that moment, it was hard not to just like swing my arms like a windmill a little bit. I know. So here at Grace Point Church, if you don't know, we're about reaching people and building community. And one of the ways we do that is through our communication cards. So if you look to your left or your right, you'll see a little card there. Look, just like Miss Tomlin's got. And it's got a space for you to fill out some information so we can connect with you. But in my eyes, more importantly, on the back, there's a spot for prayer requests and praise reports. So fill that thing out if there's any kind of prayer needs that you have. Or if you've been praying with us and along with us for a while and there's a praise report, we want to party with you. We believe in building community. And one of the ways we do that is standing in the gap together, praying with one another and being, doing life together. Prayer is one of the hugest components of that. So go ahead and fill that out as we talk a little bit and I transition. I love these powerful moments when God is just like evident in the room. Like you know he's existing. You know he's real. Our God is a real God. And especially in moments like this, I know our God is a real God because he has an amazing sense of humor. An amazing sense of humor. And the cruelest joke, it's not really cruel, it's, just, it's kind of a, a poke at my side sometimes, is that... He made me good at running because I dislike running. I, I wasn't going to say the H word, but it's that, it's that serious. I do not like to run at all. With a passion, I dislike running. But he made me good at it. Like, if I have to, I could go four or five miles and be okay. I don't like it, though. The whole entire time, I'm complaining in my head. I don't like running. I just, it's, just, it's crazy. <laughs> But, you know, there is talk about the heart in the Bible. Our hearts are muscle. We know that, right? But scripturally, scholars and theologians teach that the Bible, when it says the word heart, it means our thought, not the physical blood pumping thing in our chest. It's our thoughts. When our hearts are made of stone, it's because our minds are shut off or closed to a thought process or an idea. When he gave us a heart of flesh, he opened our mind to receive what he has to give to us, less obstinate. Paul told us in 2 Corinthians that we should capture our thoughts and change our nature to be obedient to him. Giving and serving our actions based on our heart, our thoughts. Where we put our treasure, where we put our hearts is where we show our value and what we value. 
So while working out and running is a transformative action, right? Nobody starts to run to stay the same. Our God wants our thoughts to be changed and our actions to be changed through that as well. Our heart is a muscle. It needs to be worked out. You're going to be sore the first time you give if it's been a while since you've given. It's going to hurt a little bit. It's going to feel like it hurts. It really doesn't hurt. It's transformation. It's change. We don't grow when we're comfortable. We grow when we're changing and being moved and molded. When iron is shaped, it gets beaten. It gets put in a furnace. Sometimes we are dramatic. And while I dislike running, as much as to say in a public forum on online and everything that I dislike running, it's a little dramatic because it's not that hard and I'm pretty good at it. And I think your hearts are bent the same way to giving. We like to give. We feel good after we give. I feel good after I run. I'm always glad I did. I'm never upset that I ran. I'm always happy. And sometimes the results aren't immediate. But over time, change does happen. And, you know, now I lead, I lead a life of fitness. Running isn't the only way that I work my heart out. I do many other things. And giving is one of the ways, the foundational way to work our heart out. But there's many other ways to do that. Serving in your church, volunteering in the back with the kiddos, right? Door greeter. Volunteering to pray for somebody when you see them hurting. Giving is just the foundational, easiest baseline way that we work out our hearts. The rest is the challenge. So there are many ways that we can give here at Grace Point Church. First off, you can go to uh, thegracepointchurch.com slash give. You can also use the PushPay app, which is what I do. Or if you're analog, you can grab an envelope from Miss Rose in the back and use your check or cash in person, and you can stick it in the box that's in the back corner over there. And um, today, I'm going to pray this giving declaration over you, so you can just join me in it in your seats here. But as I'm doing that, let's ask God to change our hearts, change our attitudes, change our minds, and not see giving slash running as a burden, but as an opportunity to exercise the gift that he gives us, all right? So, dear Jesus, as we give today's tithes and offerings, we are believing you for heaven open, earth invaded, storehouses unlocked, and miracles created. Dreams, visions, divine manifestations, anointing, giftings, callings, positions, provisions, and resources, souls from every generation to be saved and set free, carrying kingdom revelation. Thank you, Father, that as we join our value system to yours, you will shower favor, blessing, and increase upon us so that we will have more than enough to co-labor with heaven and see Jesus get his full glory. Lord, we love you and we thank you. And we ask that today you help us capture our thoughts and change our perspective. Help us exercise our hearts and our giving nature. Lord, to be obedient to you, but to also be a blessing to others. Lord, we thank you so much for all the gifts you give us, for all the blessings and all the things we didn't deserve. And we ask that now that our offerings and our tithes and the things that we give to you would be enough and worthy in your eyes. We know you can multiply and will multiply and do so much more than we could ever imagine with what we could do with it. And we thank you for that multiplication. It's in, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would, please turn your attention to the screens for some announcements. Help us fill 50 shoeboxes for kids in need around the world. The mission of Operation Christmas Child is to demonstrate God's love. Help us fill 50 shoeboxes for kids in need around the world. The mission of Operation Christmas Child is to demonstrate God's love in a tangible way to children in need around the world. Throughout this project, Samaritan Purse partners with the local church worldwide to share the good news of Jesus Christ and make disciples of the nations. Stop by the table outside room 7 for more details. Sunday, October 30th is Family Day. Grace Kids, ages 3 and up, will remain with their families in the sanctuary during service. Kids' worship activity bags will be provided. 
and the nursery will only be available for newborns to two years old. We have Victory Weekend coming back up this November 4th and 5th from 6 to 9 p.m. A Victory Weekend is an event designed to create moments where men and women can hear from God and learn physical ways to walk out their faith in victory. This will be a powerful time of learning more about who we are and how God sees us through His Son, Jesus Christ. This weekend will include corporate teachings, breakout sessions, and one-on-one -on -one ministry time. Following Victory Weekend, on Sunday, November 6th, we will also have water baptisms. We hope that you'll be able to participate with the rest of us over this weekend. Sign up or register through the Church Center app today. Good morning, church family. It is so good to see you, although the lights are kind of bright, so I'm just going to say it's good to be seen because I can't really see you right now. Uh, also, special welcome to anyone watching online. I think my parents are tuning in and maybe some of my friends, uh, which is fine because they're long distance. But if you're watching online and you live in Abilene, Pastor Rich is too nice, so I'm going to say it. Get your butt back in church. We miss you. We miss you. We will accommodate you as much as we are need as much as is needed, but we miss seeing you in person. So please come. We are continuing in our generous a generous life series. Um, the past two weeks have been great with Pastor Rich, bringing the word and going through it. And what is so phenomenal about the series is we're not just talking about oh you got to be generous like. Just, just do it, right? It's the good Christian thing to do. But we're looking at the beauty in, in giving. And today, we're going to talk about how we can give what we have. So if you are a note taker, if you want a title for this page, the date is Sunday, October 23rd. Brittany Martinez is preaching, and the title is Give What You Have. So before diving into scripture and the rest of the sermon, I gotta, I gotta shake it up because I'm uh, the campus minister, one of the campus ministers here with our college students, and I just, I just, gotta, I just gotta shake it up a little bit. So um, you guys seem to really like when I did the anonymous polls, one of the last times I preached, so we're gonna do that again this morning. So the first question I have for you while they're trying to accommodate me with my complicated screen work. The first question that I have for you is, what do you have? What do you have? So you're going to need to pull out your smartphone. There's going to be a QR code that's going to come up on the screen, and you will be answering the question, what do you have? Can you guys, can you guys get the QR code? Is it big enough? Yes, great. Well, you're sitting on the front row, so that's just easy for you. <laughs> so the first question is, what do you have? Two participants are typing. Three participants are typing. I love when people participate. You have finances, time, anointing, family. You have Karen. We do have Karen. Yes, I think everyone has, yes. Time's a good one, yeah. You have your giftings. That love, okay, why, my name should not, thank you, but. Need for speed, okay, this is the risk we run doing stuff like this. Okay, you guys. Do you, does it showing up on your guys' phone too? Okay, that's cool. So you guys don't need to see this as much. Positivity, hope, you have work, willingness to give, community, skill, that's a good one. A hearing ear, I can't with you guys, <laughs> need for speed. All right, so these are all things, all right, John, you can stop it. <laughs> I'm tired of need for speed, getting boosted. <laughs> 
These are all things that we recognize are things or, or talents um, or even like material possessions that we have. Um, so let's look at a, a scripture in Mark, this, this, these short verses that tell us a story about someone who gave all that she had. So Mark 12, 41 through 44, it is on the screen already, says he sat down, he is Jesus He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums, and a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box, for they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put everything she had, all that she had to live on. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you are, you are a speaking God, that you are speaking to us even now and through the scripture. We pray for, um, for a soft heart, for open ears to hear what you would have to say to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So since we are in the book of Mark, I wanted to give you guys some, some, some background for what this book is or what it is contains, um, kind of the context surrounding it, because it's just helpful. It's it's just good to have. It's good to have the context of what we are reading, so you guys don't think I just uh, cherry-pick random verses that I want to talk about, and that's not actually what they mean. So this book was written sometime between 60 and 80 CE, Common Era, um, also known as AD, after after death, um, and it actually most likely influenced the writing of the Gospel of Mark, or the Gospel of Matthew, and the Gospel of Luke, so it's a, it's a pretty formative book. Obviously, it's in our Bible, but it's also a pretty formative b- book for some of the books that were to follow, and what's really interesting about this that I found in my studies and in taking a New Testament class this past summer is the genre of this book, and really the genre of all the Gospels, so you guys are going to have to just let me nerd out a little bit. And I'm hoping that you can catch some of the like giddiness I feel about how interesting the gospel genre is. Because it's not quite a biography, but it's also not a detailed historical report. And it's a narrative, but it's not like a novel because it has true things. It's so interesting because the gospel genre was a Christian invention. It was something that had, was, had never been seen before. It was something absolutely unprecedented, unprecedented, which is appropriate considering the message and mission of Jesus, the main character in this genre, was also something that the world had never seen before. And it's really cool looking at this book of Mark and kind of the gospel genre as a whole as the, the, the biography of a movement's beginnings. We can look back and see, we can, we can look back and see the beginning of the Christian movement in this genre. The themes in Mark, the main theme is the theme of the secret Messiah. Do you guys remember in your language arts or literature classes learning about irony? What's the kind of irony where the audience knows something that the characters don't? Dramatic irony. Mark is full of dramatic irony because of this secret Messiah theme where Jesus is portrayed to us, the, 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 the readers, the audience. I'm using, you guys, you guys know what I'm saying. It's not just audience. We are also participants and re- recipients, but we are the audience kind of in this metaphor. We, we know that Jesus is the He is the Messiah. He is the Redeemer. But everyone else, all the other characters in this book, get so close, and then they just miss it. And so there's this theme of the secret Messiah where we know, and Jesus is fully aware and fully operating in his identity as the Messiah. But it's almost like it's a secret because of that dramatic irony. We also see that Jesus Jesus is... being is very clearly portrayed in this book as well. His, his being human, his being the Son of God, his being the Messiah, his being Lord. And then when it comes to the structure, this book is broken down into three major acts. So chapters 1 through kind of most of 8, or 826, is the mission in Galilee. Act 2 is a tradi- transition from Galilee to Jerusalem. 
And then act three in chapters 11 through 16 is his mission in Jerusalem. Look at you guys being all studious. I love it. Nerds unite. <laughs> Let's go. Uh, so this, 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 this story that we see with the widow offering these, these two copper coins, which amount to a penny, is, is seen at the, towards the beginning of Act 3. In the context of what's happening, by the time we get to Act 3, because I'm not going to walk us through the whole, the whole book of Mark, because we don't have all the time for that. So in Act 3, Jesus is in Jerusalem, and he is causing problems. He is causing problems. He has cursed the fig tree. Well, first, in his entrance to Jerusalem, he's riding on a donkey. And everyone's like, why? And also, this is causing a great commotion. We're not fans of that. Then he curses the fig tree. The fig tree dies. He teaches out of it. He uh, cleanses the temple. So he goes in and just yeets. <laughs> yeets the tables and gets out all of the, all of the bad people. He's causing problems. And in chapter 12, where we find this story of the widow giving her coins, the primary thing that we see Jesus doing is teaching and correcting Israel's leaders, which is really interesting because instead of this just being a story that is just like, oh, cool, like we should do like what the widow does and give all we have, this story is sandwiched. It is in the middle of all of these other stories all these other instances of Jesus teaching and correcting Israel's leaders. And in verse 44, actually, I'm just going to read the whole thing. Now that we have the context, let's read it again with, with, with the eyes of the surrounding context. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums, and a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put everything she had, all that she had to live on. In this last verse, the point that Jesus is making isn't, oh, who gave more? But what do you have to give? And Pastor Rich last week said a lot of great quotes that I wrote down. I basically wrote my sermon during his sermon last week because he just said a lot of, a lot of good things. Sorry. Um, one of the things he said, because he, he was talking about our inner motivation. One of the things he said is we want to look at what we get. We want to look at what we have before we're willing to give it. And when it comes to our motivation, that's not a good motivation to have because we know that if our needs are met in Christ, we don't have to know everything we have before we give it. We can give freely and abundantly and generously because we know that we have all that we need in Christ. So when it comes to our motivation, we need to give before we know what we have. But when it comes to the practicals, we do need to look at what we have because we are supposed to give what we have. And how can we give what we have if we don't know what we have? That's the poll question, yeah? You guys connecting? Connecting the dots? You guys there? Great. Let's keep moving. So the question, what do you have? What is in your hands? Not actually, like right now. But what, what do you have? What's the commercial? What's in your wallet? Is that Allstate? No. Capital One. Yes, Capital One. It is the same, it's the same guy as not, I, mm, Rabbit Trail because I read that in the voice. What's in your wallet? What's in your hands? But seriously, what do you have? We have to have this honest, self-reflective moment where we acknowledge and, and, and notice what we have so that we can give it. So the first thing, I'm just going to start with maybe the most obvious is money. Varying amounts. But just like Manny was saying, our spending tells the story of our priorities. What we see happen in this, in this scripture in Mark with the widow is that she gave all that she had. What does that tell us about her priorities? She gave all 
that she had. And so when we look at our spending, what does it tell us about our priorities? And this isn't, it's always so weird talking about money in church, right? Because it's been abused either on the like manipulative, give us all your money side, or also the manipulative, give us all your money side, but like prosperity gospel. And so it's so weird to talk about it sometimes in church because we ha- we've, we've noticed those like icky, icky situations before. But what story does your spending tell about your priorities? Are you being generous with what you have? More than, more than looking at our priorities, though, this is a chance to trust, giving our money, being generous with money, is a chance to trust God with something that our society tells us we have to control, that we have to hoard. It, 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 our world is, is convinced and functions with the mindset of, if I don't keep this, if I don't take care of myself, no one else will. But that's not the attitude that the church has. And so we can be generous with our money, specifically. It is a chance to trust God with something. And I think with this in mind, I want to pose the question to you. I think Pastor Rich mentioned mentioned it last week, too. When will it be enough? If we are so tempted to hoard and control our money until we get to a certain point where it's like, okay, now I will be generous. Now I will give. What is that point? When will it be enough? Will we ever have enough to feel like we're in a good enough place to be generous? Or can we trust God and give what we have? The second thing that we have is other resources. And the the one I want to hit on the most right now is our time. In a microwave society, you guys know what I mean, microwave versus like crockpot society where a microwave is just like, yes, like two minutes and food is ready versus a crockpot, which is like, oh man, this, this meat is falling off the bones. So good. In a microwave society, our time is one of our most valuable resources. In some ways, it's more valuable than money. And we all have, the great thing about time is we all have the same amount of time. So, how can you give what you have? And what's, what's interesting that I'm even just now noticing talking through this is with money and time, by participating in a generous lifestyle, in the beauty of giving our money and time in a society that tells us to hold those things for ourselves, we are, we are participating and facilitating the upside-down kingdom. We are combating culture, and we are bringing the kingdom of God to earth. Have you guys prayed the Lord's Prayer before? Thy, your kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That starts with us. That starts with fighting against what culture tells us and being generous, looking at the beauty and giving. The third thing that we have as believers is the gospel. We have personal salvation. We have received salvation in Christ. Titus 2, 11 through 14 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who himself gave for us to redeem us, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, who are zealous for good works." If you are a believer, even if you don't have money to give, even if you feel like you don't have time to give, or you just don't have time, you don't have money, you have received salvation. You have received the gospel. And there is hope and peace that is found in knowing that we are secure in Christ. 
And when we are coming from this place of that, that identity and security and in, in, in being in Jesus, that just prompts a generous lifestyle. And so we have the gospel. We have received salvation. And with the gospel, we also have this mission to share. I'm not going to I'm not going to read the Great Commission because I know I make the joke that I bring it up every time I preach. So this is just me bringing it up. I'm not actually going to make us read it again. But we have this mission to share. And looking a few verses before our story this morning with the widow in Mark 12, 28 through 33, I, I think this might be the main thesis for this entire chapter where Jesus is correcting and and rebuking and teaching Israel's leaders, one of the scribes comes up, this is verse 28, and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, Jesus, the scribe asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? And Jesus answered, the most important one is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and there is no other beside him. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. We have this mission to share because of the love that we have received. And the best way to the best way to love God and love our neighbor, to love one another is to share this good news that has changed our lives. Pastor Rich said last week, instead of asking how much do I have? The question should be how much do I love? If we have the gospel, if we are looking at what's in our hands, if we know the Great Commission commands us to go make disciples of all nations, how much do we love to do that? And I think this is a great time to bring up that, and probably the saying you guys have heard many times before, that God doesn't call the qualified he qualifies the called. And my argument, my, what I would want to put forth to you this morning is being called to, to, to preach the gospel and make disciples isn't just for me as a campus minister or me because I'm on stage or Leland because he's a worship director or Pastor Rich because he's the lead pastor. The call to make disciples is for all believers. It is for everybody who considers themselves a Christian everyone who considers themselves a part of Grace Point Church. This calling is for all of us. And so when we say that God qualifies the called, that includes you. He qualifies you to preach the gospel and make disciples, to give what you have in a generous life. And then the last thing that we have are our gifts. We have natural gifts, yes. We also have spiritual gifts. Romans 12, 3 through 8. Paul writes, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy, with cheerfulness. As a believer, you also have spiritual gifts, things that the Lord has blessed you with to be a part of this body, to be a part 
of the church. And I, th- I think it's important to say, especially if you grew up in church and you're familiar with church language and spiritual gifts conversations, that this is not a personality test or a personality assessment, but a role that we play. And so we can't allow ourselves to get sidetracked where we get so caught up into figuring out what I am and this is what I have to contribute. And we can't let ourselves get so siloed, like, oh, no, I just, I just, what is, mm, I just exhort. That is what I do. I do nothing else. Let me know if you need exhorting. (laughs) So we can't let ourselves get sidetracked into, like, the personality assessment stuff or siloed into thinking that I can't fulfill any any other any other role but this is like a job this is a role that we are meant to play in the body and other other scriptures talking about spiritual gifts tell us that the point of these gifts is for the building up of the church it's not just for fun it's not just so we can do whatever we want with them but so we can build up the church and Oh my gosh, the the verse in Ephesians is just so we can build up the church so we can reach the maturity of our faith so that we can become more like Christ together so we can see the world one for him as we preach the gospel and make disciples. And in 1 Corinthians 12, it, it, it tells us that the head isn't just Christ but a part of a specific body, which means we... It makes sense because we're all sitting here this morning. We are all part of a local body, and we all function as a different body part. In this body, we are called to walk in that assignment, in that gifting. And we are called to fulfill that responsibility. And so we can be generous with the gifting that we have. We can give what we have first because it comes from God. Right? We don't need to worry about running out. It comes from the Lord. But because it is for the betterment of the church, it is to advance God's kingdom here on our earth. But even after going through these things, even knowing what we have, even knowing that God qualifies the cult, we can still deal with insecurities. We can still deal with fear. We can still, we can still deal with, with lack. So I have another question for you guys to answer. And this question is, what do you need? What do you need? First thing I want to say is that Jesus can meet all of these needs. He can. And he wants to. I think it's it's important to remember that God is speaking. And we just have to listen. And when we consider the sacrifice that Jesus made for us on the cross, we, we don't, there's no, there's no room to question God's love for us. 
and his power to meet our needs. So God, God can and wants to meet these needs. Because we know that our needs are met in Christ, we can also give while we still feel like we need things. We can still participate in, in, in considering what we have with open hands, not holding it and then giving it, but open hands. So even while we are still waiting on God to meet needs that maybe only he can meet, we can still give because we know our needs are met in Christ. So you guys saw the responses that were up there. And because we exist as a community to build up each other. The last question is looking at those responses, what can you give? So you know what you have, you, you know what you need, but what can you give to someone else this morning? Pastor Rich told us last week that the kingdom of God isn't what we get out of it, but it's what we give into it. With the widow giving everything she had, even the stories of the loaves and fishes, it brings us to the question of what can God do with what we have to give? What can God do with what you have to give? Spoiler alert, it's much more than what you can do by yourself. Much more than what you can do holding on to it. So since I like to do things differently, if you have any complaints, please uh, email Pastor Rich. We're going to do this right now. In your families or in groups of three or four, Give what you have. Pray for the person. Give what you said you have to give. You put it up there. It's anonymous, so I can't tell who did what. But you said you have something to give. Now do it. Because I think when we, when we consider, you know, especially when it comes to sharing the gospel or being believers uh, who, who make disciples, we get a little overwhelmed because it's like, how do, I, how do I give what I have? Why not start here? We are, we are here to build each other up. So get into groups of three or four or with your families and offer what you can give. And then I'll come back up and close us.